Yeah, thank you very much for uh, inviting me here. I thought you might be interested in this, and also this allows me to perhaps find more veterans and more students. So it's a quid pro quo here. I'll entertain you for a few minutes, I hope, and then you can supply me with some veterans and students, if you will. The Veterans History Project was started in 2000 by the Library of Congress. Believe it or not, the government can do something right, and they've done this right. Uh, this is a well-designed project uh, uh, that I'll, I'll walk you through how I got involved with this. The, uh, the, the point of the project is to record stories from the horses' mouths, so to speak, of veterans about their experiences and then to put that in the Library of Congress forever. Uh, if this is not done, then these stories are lost. And after, even though I taught, chem I taught chemistry, taught 20 years, taught chemistry, and uh, it has nothing to do with history, I started thinking about this, and history is just a bunch of stories. None of us, well, maybe you did in 98, maybe you had talked about it. <laughs> But none of us has ever seen a video of George Washington or heard his words, but we believe he existed. We never saw a photograph of George Washington, but believe he existed merely because of stories. So that's what history is, a bunch of stories. And so these stories are firsthand. They come right from Boris's mouth. And one thing that the uh, Library of Congress did is I am not allowed to edit the video. Because if you ever edit something, then you put your point of view toward it. So it has to go to the Library of Congress unedited. Now, I, we have a video today, and I edited it, but this is not going to the Library of Congress, so I can do this. So well, give me a slide here, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, this is a flyer I made up for a, a request of one of the teachers involved. And I have I put this in various places. Uh, this just gives me the, uh, my email address if you ever see this. In the next slide, please. Uh, first of all, how I got involved with this is I just stopped teaching at uh, Florida Gulf Coast University. And I was trying to think about what I wanted to do. And my brother-in-law is involved with the Pleasure. Collier County Honor Flight. This is a national or a, <coughs> a program, and Collier County has this. this is again, it's a private type of organization, as far as I can tell. Uh, two people here, husband and wife, uh, Sean and Debbie Lux, L U X, uh, are the founders <coughs> of Collier County. And the gist of this organization is a occasionally take veterans, take them to Washington, D.C., DC, show them around Washington. This is a way of giving credit to veterans who have served, give them recognition. And then they're escorted back to uh, uh, Naples, and uh, there's a much, much of hoopla involved with this, uh, recognition of their accomplishments. And my brother-in-law, Fred Sullivan, is on the board there. And he said, well, these veterans have these great stories. And the veteran, veterans are dying, and these stories are not being recorded. So I said, well, maybe I'll record the stories. My initial idea was to start a web page and uh, record the stories and put up on my web page. This is not a good way of doing it because I'm 70 years old. And unless I live to 98, I will not be here very long, and therefore the web page will disappear. So this is not ideal. I did find out about a Collier County initiative right here. This was started in 2004 by two uh, veterans. I forget the name. One was Johnson. I can't remember the other one. However, it only lasted two years. But the idea here was to take uh, audio recordings of veterans and put them on the Collier County website. But for whatever reason, it, no, it, it ceased after 2005. I stumbled across it, and I found the audios, and all the links were broken. So I contacted Collier County, and I said, your links are broken. And they fixed it. And then I said, well, can I give you more stories? And they said, no. <laughs> I don't, they don't have the money. It comes down to that, they just don't have the money or the manpower to do it. Because originally, people 
donated at times, but because uh, they were donated at times, then you get to this problem, labor problem. But anyway, it's still there. You can go to the site, you can hear the stories, the links have been fixed. But again, I, it was a dead end. But then I heard about the Veterans History Project. And that's why and I thought, well, this is great. In the next slide, please. Uh, this is a field kit. So you can go to the Veterans History Project. It's uh, the, the uh, uh, go back one, uh, okay, I'm sorry. If you look up here, this is where you go right here. That's the web page, and you can find everything there is to know about the Veterans History Project. And the next slide, please. Uh, is, uh, this is the field kit that you can download, and this tells you how to do it. Well done, and there's even a video on the web page that is a 16 minute video that shows you what it's all about. But being a teacher, I decided that I wanted to get uh, students involved because, again, I wanted to put the generations together here. And many people complain about the fact that the students, the younger generation, doesn't know what has been done for them. So rather than complain about it, this is a way of fixing that to some degree. It's putting the students together with the veterans and both benefit the veteran sees that people appreciate what is, uh, that people appreciate what was done and the student understands what has been done for them. So this works, I think, well for both. Uh, next slide, please. All right, this is the uh, article. This is uh, one of the pages of the article on August 10th. The uh, student you're looking at here is uh, Jared Cresto. Fortunately, I, the, way I, the way I get find people is just like this. I communicate with people. Probably, if things go right, one of you will give me a veteran to call or a student who is, you think might be interested. And if I, you know, even a small percentage is better than no percentage. So the way I got Jared, he, he's planning and going to FGCU, so I got contacts at FGCU. I was able to put it together with the people at FGCU to uh, establish this chain of links of uh, networking. And he thinking about a minor in journalism, so this is perfect for Jared. The way I found Jared is everybody who says, what are you doing these days? Anybody who sees that. I pull out my card here and said, this is what I'm doing. And I was at the dentist's office and the woman was cleaning my teeth and she said, what are you doing? And I pulled out my card and explained it. She said, oh, my son is considering a career in journalism. And that's how I got hooked up with Jared. And he's been a stalwart here. Unfortunately, last week we had an uh, interview set up for Saturday, and unfortunately uh, he got his bell rung. He got a concussion because he's a football player for, uh, for uh, Naples Baptist Academy, and unfortunately he was a little dingy that day, so his mother said, I don't think so, so I had to cancel it. But, uh, he's been, now, if you look at the background, that's uh, Garrett Chapman. And the way I got him is uh, he's in the background here looking intently at uh, Wayne Smith, but anyway is I would go to the honor flight when they flew back into Naples, and I was a stalker. I'd walk around, <laughs> and I'd see anybody with a uniform on, especially young people, and I'd go over to them and I'd say, take me to your leader. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd conduct me to some, some <coughs> Boy Scout or Girl Scout poncho there, and I'd explain the situation. And I, uh, I, I met a uh, woman named Patty Monahan, who is a, again, some leader in the venturing crew. I never heard of the venturing crew, but she's the leader in the venturing crew. And that's how I got a hold of that guy. We found that with Gary Chapman. And he was going for his Eagle Scout. And to become an Eagle Scout rank, you have to have some kind of project. So this was his project. So that's how I, and he, he did many, many interviews. Uh, and also, he, this is the way things go in life is I, I realize this, and that's why I work every contact as much as I can. He goes to Palmetto Ridge High School. Now, I contacted the junior ROTC, ROTC, at all these schools and got no reply, which I was really surprised at because I thought ROTC would be interested in this. So I, since uh, uh, Garrett was uh, a student at the Palmetto Ridge, I contacted the principal and I said, can I meet with you for 15 minutes? because I'm working with one of your students, that contact here, and the principal said, okay, and I met with the principal, and I explained exactly how, what I needed from him. I needed students, I needed veterans, and he said, oh, we have a junior Rossi here. And I said, oh, we do. Of course, I had contacted them earlier, so I knew they had a junior Rossi there. And he contacted the head of the 
the Rod Sea. And all of a sudden, they were very interested. And tomorrow, I'm going to address them there. So this is how things are done in life. It's good, always good to go to the top. So that's how this all eventuates. So I'm, I'm always looking for more students because Jared got his ego rank and he's no longer part of the program. Jared here in the front here is still involved. He's still interested because he, this is a good practice for a journalism career because interviewing is part of journalism. And the next uh, slide here, please. Uh, these are two uh, young ladies that uh, and they were not in, interested in, in the uh, Veterans History Project, but they were interested in something called the Korean War Veterans Memorial Foundation because a neighbor happens to be a veteran of the Korean War. So I said, well, let's team up. You do the interviews, you can use the uh, video on both websites. You can send it to the VHP and you can send it to the website for the veterans, the Korean War Veterans Memorial Foundation. That's in San Francisco, by the way. And they said, fine. And so they were, you know, I am putting this all together and helping the students. These two girls, they just took off. They said, get out of my way. <laughs> <laughs> they got all the equipment. They, bar they borrowed it from some friends who have a professional studio. And they were uh, very good, at, you know, excellent about this. And so they went out on their own, which is fine with me, which is my intent here, is after I go through the process of training these kids, maybe they'll just do it on their own, or maybe you'll do it on your own. Because it can be, it's doable. I mean, if I can do it, you can do it. You know, nothing fancy about it. Okay, and so uh, it was interesting in this interview. We it's the Korean War veteran is uh, one after the interview. Uh, we can't. He wouldn't sign the release. So, well, this happens for one reason or another. This happens, but that's okay. Can you ask him ahead of time? Hmm? Can you ask them ahead of time? We did. Ah. It was all set up. Uh, this happens, you know, because this is their story. And afterwards they said, I don't think so. That's okay. I'm not going to. And they did the service. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, let's get down to the nitty gritty here. In the field kit, they tell you the file formats that you are acceptable by them. They're very good about if you have a question, which I did, about some file, the file formats that aren't listed there. Uh, if you use iMovie on a Mac and you export the file, it comes into an M4V file, and that's not listed there. It's an MP4, but it's an M4V. So I want to make sure that's acceptable, so I emailed them, and they're very good about getting back to you. In fact, they'll get back to you usually that day if you email them early enough. It's very unusual for any governmental organization to get back to you so quickly, but they did. They said, yeah, it's fine, we can do that. I also uh, in contact with them because I'll you know, talk about it in a minute, is sometimes something happens, like the uh, veteran has to go to the bathroom. And so I, they say, you can't edit it. And I said, well, wait a minute, I have to edit it. I have to take these two files and put them together. That's the technical editing. And they said, oh, so that's okay. That's the technical reason. You can't do it because of philosophical, <coughs> because you want to put your own bias toward the story. And if you do that, if you edit anything. But if it's a technical reason, and I'll get it. I'll tell you why that's important later. But anyway, here are the file formats. And you can do a, you can do an audio recording, or you can do a video recording with audio. That's your choice. They prefer the video with the audio because, again, because of the modern technology. Next slide, please. Okay, let's get down a little more <laughs> nuts and bolts here because you have to notice I spent about three thousand dollars making mistakes. So, <laughs> so, you know, I, you know, here's the system I eventually uh, worked up here. Now, I, because I understand things go wrong and things do go wrong, I wanted two cameras recording this because for some reason or another, one will break. <laughs> Usually it's operator error. Usually it's my mistake. But for some reason, one won't work. So that's why I put the two together, and this works pretty well. Now this is an, uh, the, uh, this is an iPhone. This is a 5S. So it, it works just fine. It works great. And this is a camcorder. This is a Sony ATR CX455. It's a relatively expensive camcorder. It works great too. 
I lucked out because I picked two things that really worked just by luck. Now, one thing I wanted to know here is that I had look into is these microphone things because I had the best way of recording audio is by lavalier mics. In other words, you buy these are called lavalier mics. You'll see them on the newscasters on television clipped through there. And you buy two of them. Fortunately, they're cheap. They're 20 bucks a piece. And then you clip them up to the interviewer and the subject, and you put them into a Y connector here. And then you put this into the 3.8 millimeter jack on the Sony, or the I put it to the, to the uh, 5S, and therefore you have the best audio because audio is a huge, it's about 80% of this. It's not video, but it's audio. And these $20 level earmarks work just great. So, you can put this, except for the cameras. Now this is an expensive tripod, tripod, but you don't need an expensive tripod. You can buy a $25 tripod, it works just fine. Uh, you can put this system together, except for the, the camcorders, for about 125 bucks. So it's not that expensive. Now most people have cell, uh, smartphones, so you can put two smartphones together, rather than a camcorder, and you'll have your two cameras. You can have one of them working on the internal microphone. That's what this works on. It gives you good, no, no a lavalier microphone, just the internal mic, which is right here. And as long as you, and this is why I learned my trial and error, as long as you get close enough, it gives you great sound. So this can be done for a relatively little amount of money. You don't have to have a large wall to do this. I spent a lot of money just by failing, by learning this stuff. And you learn little things. Give me the next slide, please. Yeah, there's a picture of the, I wanted to show you the next one, please. Okay, now if you notice right up here, you see, you can't see it from your sitting, but it says there, it says plug in power. There are different types of microphones. Powered microphones and unpowered microphones. If you have unpowered microphones, then you have to have a device that's called plug in power. And that's what this, both of these have plug and power. And I say, if you look right here, I say it's hard to read. It says plug and power right there. That means the device supplies the power to the microphone. These are called electric, E-L-E-C-T-R-E-T -E -E microphones. Not electric, electric. And that means they're unpowered. So, be careful of that because if you don't pay attention to this stuff, you'll buy, which I did, buy equipment that won't work very well. You have to be careful of the details. You have to get the, the granularity here. I didn't realize that these connectors came in a, a host of different types of connectors. This is called a TRRS connector. This will work for this. It won't work for that. Even both, even both, both have plug and power. This needs a TRS and this needs a TRRS. So this is the stuff you learn as you make mistakes and find a system. Because I wanted to put a system together that is, was affordable by schools. And I want to make sure that the student was interested and they could do this on their own. So I didn't want expensive professional grade equipment. Okay, next, next slide please. So this is the setup I find. You can see the power cords. There are two power cords. Now the power cords are also important because you never know, long, know how long the interview is going to last. It has to be by the rules, by the regulations of the Library of Congress, 30 minutes. Now you have enough power in your batteries for either of these cameras for 30 minutes. If it goes longer than that, then you run out of power. You need the power because uh, one interview went for an hour and a half. You never know how long the veteran's going to talk. And you can't stop them. You can't say that's enough. It's their story. They can go as long as they want. So you need it to power them. Now, I don't know about the, the, the uh, recent iPhones that only have one connector. They've done away with the 3.8 millimeter connector that has <coughs> in here. So that's going to be difficult because you'll be able to get the mic, but you won't be able to uh, refresh the power. You won't be able to power it as you go along. <coughs> so this is what I put together. Next slide, please. And this again is just the only thing I had to manufacture was this thing right here. This allowed me to put both cameras and all I got was a piece of uh, aluminum, drilled some holes in it and then threaded the center so that it would fit any camera, uh, 
the screw that goes into any mounting any tripod. Uh, this, is, this is a quick connect for the tripod right here. All tripods come with quick connect. So this is how I got them both here. This uh, does away with the necessity of having two tripods. You can use two tripods if you want to. It's one more complication that I didn't want to deal with is two tripods, but you can have two tripods if you prefer. This allows me to focus and frame the, uh, uh, if you'll notice in the video, I did a lousy draw of framing. This was an earlier interview. But this allows you to frame them at one, one, at one time, and then both of the cameras will be in, <coughs> in frame. Okay, the next uh, slide, please. Yeah, the other thing I learned, <laughs> some cell phones. I went to, uh, I had the 5S and I went to the Google 5 Android phone because uh, I was in, sort of intrigued by the, how they were doing it. And it's got a, it's got a power jack and it's got a uh, 3.8 millimeters. What I didn't know is that certain phones have file size limitations, 3.8 gigabytes. Now I've heard two explanations for this. One is the file format is the reason, and one is the operating system is the reason, whether it's a 32-bit or a 64. I can't find the answer of why, but they just do. And this goes for some camcorders. The Zoom line camcorders are inexpensive, but they have this 3.8 gigabyte file size limit. This doesn't, neither does this. You can shoot all day with this as long as you've got power. I just lucked into it. I didn't make the mistake of getting the wrong. But this is what you have to consider when you're trying to put this together. Next slide, please. OK, here's what I came up with was uh, we shoot it uh, as if possible. If the person, we, we had to go out to some people's houses because they were so ill because they're Second World War veterans and they can't get around anymore. We try to do it here just because it's convenient. I can reserve the room. And if you notice here, I got a backdrop. I got three lights you don't you know, And I've got the, uh, the camera about three foot feet away from the, the subject. And that puts, puts the system close enough so that the internal microphone will pick up the audio. OK, so that's expensive. You don't have to be that expensive. You can start using that semi-professional backdrop I bought there, you can use a sheet, which I have done. Next uh, slide, this is the last slide. And you don't need those fa fancy uh, photo lab types of lighting. You can go to the uh, hardware store and pick up a $10 light like that and put a piece of uh, cheesecloth or parchment paper in front of the light to soften if you want to soften it if you don't like the brightness of it. So that's the, the granularity, that's the details you have to think about when doing this. And therefore, if you want to do this, call me up. <laughs> I'll help you out. Because as I say, I've made a lot of mistakes and spent a lot of money making mistakes. And I'll, and I'll, I'll run you and I'll be there if you want to interview somebody and help you out on it. Or if you want to borrow my equipment or want, want me to be the cameraman, I'll do that too. But too, yeah. You said the, the uh, library would not allow edited uh, product. Except but it occurred to me that, you know, these interviewees are older folks. What if they, in the middle of the interview, wanted to take a break? That's what I say. That's what you can, that's, that's called a technical reason. They refer to that as a technical reason. It's not a bias reason. It's not a philosophical reason. It's a technical reason. That's okay. So you would record them saying that Cut they it. wanted to take a break? Yeah. And then that would be okay? Cut it. And that's happened. That's why, that's why I emailed them to find out. I said, you told me not to edit it, but i got a problem here. Yeah. It won't be the, uh, the person, uh, I'll tell you this story in a minute. Uh, the, the person said, I have to go to the bathroom. I said, well, you know, we cut it. And I said, i got a problem here. i got this, you know, this thing. It's okay, you can, you can point. I did that in iMovie, by the way. I joined them together, no problem. Yeah. So you used iMovie? Uh, Reluctantly. Mm -hmm. I used iMovie. <laughs> yes. Why do you say you love it? It's 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 not it's not intuitive. I mean, I've learned how to use it, but it's not intuitive. I mean, there are probably easier ways of doing this than I would. For instance, if you go up there, in most places, if you wanted to save your project, you go up to File Save. There is no save. Now you have to go File Share, and you find out. And at the bottom it says. 
uh, Facebook, <coughs> Twitter, et cetera, et cetera, oh, down there is five. Okay, so I'm just saying this, that there's little things I just, it irritates me. But it's, it works, it works fine, it's free, use it. And I did, I put the, the uh, one of the interesting interviews, at least for me it was, is that there was a transgender veteran, a major in the Air Force who became transgender after she got out. It was he when he was in, she when she got out. <laughs> and it was interesting for me because there's two stories here. She flew a plane, I forget what the designation is, she flew a plane, I think there were 40 missions in, Viet in Vietnam. Her job was to, and she had uh, somebody in the other chair in the plane, her job was to find the enemy, radio back the GPS of the enemy, and drop smoke. And of course, she's getting shot at all this time because they don't want her to pinpoint. So for her to do 40 missions, getting shot at like this, you know, was extraordinary that survived, just to survive. Because one day she talked about the difference in life and death. She said she had this wrong feeling that she said, I got to juke to the left. And she juked to the left, and all of a sudden she saw the lead coming up to her right. So this is how close life and death is to uh, for these people I've interviewed is that in story after story after story about uh, they were this close to death and that they made it through. So she had two stories, you know, what she, while, while she was in service, what happened, and after the service is what happened. That's what was, and what was really interesting to me is I, I realized this might be controversial for the students, so I contacted the students. I said, is this going to, I don't know what kind of parents are, what kind of religion they have. I said, this guy, they couldn't care less. <laughs> You know, my generation, there was this homophobia. You know, anybody that was different from you was all of a sudden, you know, an outsider. This generation doesn't care. That was very refreshing for me to see that they really didn't care. So I said, no. They, they looked at me askance, like, why would I even ask? Well, because my generation, we were homophobic. So, but I say, and what's interesting, the way I get the veterans, a lot of them, is I go to Homer Helter. If you've heard the name, Homer Elter, he owns a flea mart on Shirley Street, and this is where veterans congregate, older veterans, who are retired, and they sit around and tell stories all day. And so I found out this place, I went down there, and first of all, they were skeptical, but every day I bought food, but it was food of some type, so eventually it was Pat and they saw me coming, and they <laughs> started to accept the fact that Eventually they got used to me and they accepted me, but this is where I got a lot of references. But then I see uh, this major, an Air Force major named Jess, who's, these guys are homophobic and racist and everything else you can think about. But anyway, <laughs> to see Jess there sitting with them, and they accepted her. That was interesting because she was one of them. She got shot at. I mean, she, you know, she, was, she did her time, and that's why. That's what, again, it was refreshing to see that. that uh, they were shit sitting there like, and, and it's like, <clears throat> it was, you know, she's a drag. So it's, 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 it was a, and I could tell the first time I met her that, that this is not a woman. Uh, but I thought, okay, then why is she here? <laughs> yeah, that was interesting for me. But she's still teaching, uh, she's still giving uh, flight lessons at the airport. So she's still involved with flight. She's been on flight all her life. And in fact, that's one of the first things she remembers on the farm was looking up and seeing the plane going by and said, I'm going to do that someday. So that was, that was, that's an interesting story. The whole story is interesting to me, is, is that, that she came back alive and that she went through all this thing after her life. And so there's two stories here, the combat story and then the other story. So that was a fascinating story to me. Anyway, okay, now you mean, uh, yeah. Can I access that interview by going to the... Uh, you will, eventually. It takes about six months. So if my students cross my fingers are doing what they're supposed to doing, they're submitting the stuff to the, uh, the Library of Congress. It takes about six months. So I keep on checking. I say, have you done this? Yeah, we've done this. And I'm always, I've taught for 20 years, so I don't always trust what people tell me. But <coughs> there's nothing I can do about it. The answer is yes, we will. Yeah. So they're submitting? Yeah. They're submitting. It's your job. I'm saying I'm giving them responsibility. I'm saying this. I'm not your mother. I'm giving you an opportunity to do this, but that's why, as a teacher, what I found is the parents are taking their helicopter parents. They're taking too much responsibility for the kids. Let the kids do it. They're capable of doing it. 
let them do it. And if you know, you have to trust them a little bit. So yeah, so they're doing it. And you have to, yeah. Sir, so, um, there's two things. One, that the gentleman died from the outer skelter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last week, I think. He did, yes, true. And then also, there is a beautiful, very impressive Korean war memorial in Washington. Yes. Yes. It will really touch you at night with the blue bus and it shakes you up. Well, that's what, the, that's what the honor flight does. They take them around to the memorials and, and, and shows the uh, veterans. That's one thing. Yeah. Yeah. What if you could get a student to, to do the interview? Does someone have the equipment? Because some of these kids are Well, again, I, I think we should do this two ways. It, 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 when people, when adults ask me, can my son or daughter do this, I said, do they want to do it? That's the first question. It's not that you want them to do it. Do they want to do it? So if they want to do it, we'll figure something out. I try to work through the schools and take the student work again. This is a strategy and tactics here. I want the school to get involved, so I'd like to go through the school and say, "Your student here wants to do this part of history. It costs a certain amount of money to get this done. What do you have any funds to buy the equipment? Because if the school buys the equipment, then all of a sudden the equipment's there. So, so the answer is, if they say no, then I'll just be cameraman. You know, take my equipment, use my equipment." But I'd rather the schools get involved. That's just my, my, one of my, my goals here is get, you know, have them some skin in the game here. You know, let them start realizing that we should be doing this. And that's the difficult part, if they don't want to. They, I, mean, I was a teacher for 20 years. You've got so, much, so many demands in your time, so many things going on that you've got to deal with is they just don't want one more thing to do. I'm just saying, yeah, you do. There's one more thing you have to do here. So yes, we find a student who wants to do this. Uh, well, first of all, contact the principal and say, "Can we do it at your school? Can we do it?" What if they're homeschooled? I mean, well, then, then again, you have to decide. Uh, well, that's you know, because I now, school. if you're homeschooled, you say, "This here's, here's the process. Do I have 125 dollars? I want to commit to this. You know, you, you need to. You know, can I, do I have a cell phone that's going to work? Do I can I borrow a cell phone? With Mom, can I borrow your cell phone? You know, because you, I think you don't need to. I just I think it's a good idea to have two. You can do this with one, but then you always have the danger. I'll tell you the other thing is that one, one of these things uh, died on me, merely because I didn't realize that once you delete a, a, a photo or a video, it's not deleted. It's still on your camera, unless you go back and say, oh, I want to delete it twice. And one day, my, this stopped. Fortunately, this did. This stopped. And I said, what's going on? I deleted it. It was out of space. Well, then I realized, no, you have to do two step process. You delete the video and then you delete the video again. And then it clears it from, from the, uh, the cell phone. So I'm saying is that's why I'm a little hesitant about not having two. You know, but again, you can put this together. If this, if this student is home, uh, homeschooled and is eager to do this, make sure the student wants to do more than one. You know, this is not something, this is not a lark here. This is some serious business. And so if they're so motivated, they said, yeah, I want to do five, then we'll, we'll start talking about equipment. But yeah, we can do this. But that's what I want to engender is this, you know, is, is this idea that we need to record these stories. Okay, now, uh, any more technical questions? Uh, yeah? Uh, you said you're not allowed to edit. Are there guidelines to the interviewer? Because the interviewer uh, could be directing the, the conversation to They give you, first of all, you have several types of, of people. Some people you can't shut up. <laughs> and others from good old boys from the country, their idea of, of, a, uh, of an interview is yuck and no. <laughs> so what the field kit is gives you a whole 30 questions, so that's like a minute of question, suggested questions. Now you don't have to stick to these. There are some things you have to set up where it was done, what the location was, who the interviewer is, who the subject is. There are certain questions you have to get out of the way. After <coughs> that, you have 30 questions that you step your way through. Okay. And, and, but you have to tell the veteran, this is your story. You don't have to answer any of these. And you can say whatever you want. You can be whatever you want to say. It's your story. But you have to fill up 30 minutes. 
You know, that's why we're always crossing our fingers when we do this, 30 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes. Okay, we're safe. And then, we're, and then, you know, other, it's luxury from then on. But if you look at the field kit, which you can download, it, it, they're pertinent questions, they're relevant questions. You don't get into, first, you don't say, how many people did you kill, things like that. <coughs> you just say, are there any stories that want to relate to your time in the service? Uh, what was your life before the service? What were your parents like? Do you have any family members? In other words, they're softball questions. They're really softball questions to, because many veterans don't want to tell the story because something terrible happened. And they're afraid they're going to have to tell this terrible thing. And you have to reassure them, no, you don't. You don't have to tell this terrible thing. Uh, interviewed one, and I thought, well, how much time do we have? we got 15 minutes of all the time. Okay. Uh, one of the veterans wasn't in, in combat, but after his 20 years he got out and he wanted to do something. He became a teacher, <clears throat> and after he became a teacher for several years, he still wanted to do something, so he got the idea of putting the U.S. Constitution in the hands of every student in Florida. So he got on his bicycle and went to every uh, county in Florida, meeting with the uh, representatives of that county, and saying is put these in the hands of your fifth graders. So his name was Joseph Cofield, so uh, we interviewed him, and I thought that was a great story. I say he wasn't in combat, that doesn't make a difference. He's got a great story that people should know. So I say even if you're not in combat or you didn't, you know, were in a, in a situation like that, you do have a story, and that's what we're looking for. Anything else? Yeah. When you uh, inquired about using the uh, Apple format. <coughs> And they said it was okay. Did they then change the website so I don't, don't know. have to call? I don't know. I haven't checked. Probably not. Because I don't understand the difference. I mean, I'm not that technically. I've done this by trial and error. I mean, I'm a photographer. I mean, I'm a videographer. I'm just learning this as I go along. And uh, so I'm hazy about these various designations of what an MP4. My understanding of MP4 sort of covers a whole range of formats, and M4B is one of those. So, but they said it was okay. Is there an organization countrywide that is doing this that you... Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, you go to the website, and, and I'm the organization in the Hager County. There you are. <laughs> no, no, there's nothing besides that. No, there is no... Nothing like that. For instance, the, uh, the Cuyahoga County Honor Flight is, again, just two people who, it's, even though it's a national type of thing, uh, there's no money. I mean, this letter is project, there is no money. It's just people who decide to do it. Like the Honor Flight is uh, Debbie and Sean Lux. And each Honor Flight is $80,000. So they have to, and, and they have to find $80,000 to fund these things, and that's what they do for their <coughs> My brother-in-law is, 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 is in charge of that right now, is trying to find funding. And there's some very generous people, very generous uh, companies here in Naples, who you don't know has donated vast amounts of money to this, and they just don't take any credit for it. Sometimes it's the airline will, take, will, will donate the airplane, and you don't know that because they don't, they don't broadcast it. So there's a bunch of good people around here who are you know, very generous. Yeah, I don't know if they put it on their website, and I'm trusting that they'll take the M4B if we send it to them. Uh, by the way, just for your information, one reason I like this, it's relatively inexpensive, it's like 350 bucks. It's also got a wireless facility where I can I don't have to take the memory card out or hook it up. I can just uh, wirelessly send this to the uh, Mac. I'm Mac. I'm using the iMac. So that's, a, that's sort of nice. It takes forever, but it, it, it works. So, uh, I, so I do both. Anything else? Yeah. Were the interviewees limited as to language at all? <laughs> I thought about that, and I haven't asked yet. I mean, I thought about that quite a bit, and I don't. I just haven't asked. I haven't asked if they have to be in English, is what you're saying. No. 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 I'm speaking in terms of salty language. No. No. This is as far as I know. Well. First of all, I don't know, I'm, they'll know what they do with it. They review all this. And whether they take the uh, salty language out, I doubt it. But I don't know. Uh, I don't know what they do, because they might have their own criteria in Washington and the Library of Congress. Uh, but I, I haven't gone into that. 
So that'd be a good question. I just haven't looked into it. Yeah. Have you ever listened to one of your own interviews after that? Yeah. Yeah. It? Yeah. And one got a little salty. <laughs> and it stayed that way. I don't. Yeah. No, that's what I'm saying. Did you ever? Oh, you yeah. haven't. You haven't seen the finished version? Oh, uh, no, I haven't seen any of the versions on the Library of Congress. It's been too early because I wanted to be doing it for a couple months. It takes forever to do this. Okay. I'm so, just saying. Like, so, how, uh, how long of a process? You do the interview, and then when will it show up? Well, it depends on you know, the students. Depends why they get their act together and send it in. I've been told by uh, Jared that he sent them in. Hope he's not fibbing. Yeah, and it takes about six months. So. Because, by the way, you can submit other things. For instance, again, if you have letters from that you have accumulated, it has to be at least 10 letters you can send to them. They have to be original, they can't be copies. Uh, none of this can be a, you cannot record somebody telling somebody else's story. It has to be from the horse's mouth. What I've been thinking about, and I'm, I'm gonna suggest this to JR if you see tomorrow, why don't you start a, a program where you get somebody telling you a story about somebody who's deceased and you put it on your school's website? Because otherwise, uh, these stories will disappear. And that's why I don't want to happen. But again, I don't know if that's going to fly or not. We'll see. But no, these have to be first in. They have to be from horse's mouth, cannot be edited. <coughs> this, you know, say this, this woman we interviewed who was raped in the service and also had. Uh, traumatic brain injury got sort of salty, but uh, I don't blame them. You know what I'm saying? But I don't know if they're going to end it. I just don't know. We'll find out. Yeah. Are you targeting certain veterans, like only World War II, or are you I'm not. from Afghanistan? I don't care. Anyway, anyway I'm, uh, the trouble is with the most recent ones is that they have jobs. They only have the time. They have families. Right. The reason I the Korean War and Vietnam War is they're retired, their families have moved out, et cetera, et cetera, but I'll take anything I can get. Anybody who wants to tell their story as far as I'm concerned, and you don't have to be in battle, you don't have to be in conflict. In fact, I have looked at, I have looked at the details. They, they have to have an honorable discharge, but they don't have to be in the military. You can have these be like these observers or these uh, people in Iraq and Iran who are being advisors that are not technically in the military, they can also tell their story. But I don't know the details. I haven't met those people. Well, I haven't met them, but they were also veterans. I've met some spooks, and so they don't talk about that. Well, I you know, I asked them a question about this. What did you do over there? I, I'm not going to tell you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> or I'll have to kill you. No, it's okay. Don't tell me. Yeah. How do veterans of uh, the National Guard fit into this? Fine. That's fine. Uh, yeah, Coast Guard, National Guard, anything that, you know, you have a service. <coughs> That's my understanding. I mean, I, I, in fact, I contacted them and asked the uh, Library of Congress that question. What else? What we're going to see now a uh, video, this is uh, a, a Wayne Ogden Smith. He was a uh, prisoner of war in uh, Vietnam. He was for a time in a cell next to John McCain. Uh, I only got, I, ed this is, I edited this one for the 40 minutes I edited down to nine. And uh, every time I talk to Wayne, he's got a new bit that is so fascinating. Uh, I was related to some other folks who is that they invented a alphabet based on knots, and they couldn't use Morse code because the guards would know Morse code. So they put a five by five grid of the alphabet, the American alphabet, A B C D, A B C D E, you know, and then and then they knock, and those letters meant something. They did this without talking to each other, so they had to do this by trial and error. And then, as I was saying before, I heard the story where he said when they were, they were allowed to mix together in some way or another, or even if they were not allowed to, if they were just uh, close enough that they could hear each other, the guards were on some kind of drug. I don't know if it was cocaine there or some kind of leaves they were chewing, but they had a terrible cough all day, the guards that were in the camps. So they were all day coughing and spitting. 
So what the veteran, what the POWs did, they created their own lab reading based on coughs and spits. <laughs> and they could communicate with each other by coughing and spitting. The guards didn't realize they had any problem because the guards were coughing and spitting all day anyway. So they could communicate with each other and they had a code for coughing and spitting. And this stuff is just fascinating to me is how you, you can come up with these things when you have to, I guess. Because he was in this uh, camp for five years. But anyway, uh, why don't we just run the video now? Okay, from takeoff to capture, in much detail as you wish, take us through the day you were shot down in a prison. Okay, well, I'll, I'll try to keep this brisk. Uh, you got up, at, you know, it was a, a mission, a walleye, I figured uh, we've done a lot of these, and uh, unfortunately, that missile was a little tricky. We had to go in at low, uh, usually go in at 45 degrees, and two, not two. This thing had a little ram air turbine on the back of it that propelled it. So we couldn't do over 0.9 Mach. That's slow in an aero yeah. So um, on this particular target, the power plant over there, we had to go in at 10 degree dive. We would check the sun angle and all that because it had something to do with the, the technology. Uh, but you know, so we, go, we, we knew going in it, it was going to be a tough one. And uh, uh, two of us were shot down out of four and the third one went back. Uh, so that was kind of a risky mission. And, but I was lucky. Uh, the other guys also made it out. No, and, you know, after years of incarceration, and then two of them uh, made it made it back to the base. I mean, two pilots or two pilots in each plane. So, what would you say a typical day of imprisonment was like? Uh, hmm. yeah, there was no typical days okay. in imprisonment. You never knew what to expect. To be honest with you, yet. Some days that, like, believe it or not, Sundays were days that we had a sort of like at three o'clock in the afternoon. We knew when the gong went, when they were going to their dinner, we could get on the walls and tap. But on Sundays, we always had a religious service. I don't care what belief you had, we were all together. And we tapped through the walls, uh, just so we knew. And then we spread it around, and then, you know, within 15 minutes, that was our, our service. So that was something I would call pretty common. Once and at every camp, you know, I, I moved around eight different locations, from the China border to Hanoi, but that became part of our uh, mainstay, worship. Well, what do you say the cards are like out here? Because of well, <laughs> uh, there, there, there were masochists, and then there, there were those who weren't. I remember during one torture session that I was in, where there was a younger fellow, when I was going through a lot of pain and difficulty, and he, that he actually threw up watching it. And he had some feeling. So they all weren't, you know, masochists for sure. How did you communicate with uh, Senator John McCain? Well, I was uh, next to John for not quite a year. I was in Warehouse 10, he was in Warehouse 11. When I first saw him, he was a mess, as you know, he'd broken everything. Now he survived uh, getting out of that lake. Uh, it was a miracle. And of course, they decided to keep him alive because of his father and his grandfather being formal admirals. Uh, and so, but, you know, he, he had a great sense of humor, even though he, he, he'd hobble around, he'd tell him, God, one crutch, and 
so I'm feeling some down for my gosh, but uh, he would go by after he'd pick up this little bowl of soup and, and wink to everybody because he knew we were always peeking through that door joint. We had no bars, you know, with a view or anything. But he knew uh, that we were there, so, and then when he got his arm and he could raise that high, barely raise it, and die today, he, you know, give you a thumbs up. <laughs> Trying to keep your spirits up. That helps. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, there's a strong sense of relief, but what would you say were some emotions that you had when you finally realized you could return home? Well, you know, we were uh, not totally elated or even convinced that we went home, even after the peace agreements. Uh, this might be interesting. The C-41 circle, they caught a school bus to take us out of jail that morning, gave us a pair of trousers, shoes. Here we are. And I'm looking for the first time for over years without blindfolds on, my hands bound behind me, my feet tied. And I'm sitting in the school bus, and I'm looking around Hanoi, and you can still see bomb you know, things because the, uh, the B-52s over December. Now this is March, so they had cleaned up the whole city, but, okay. but, but here we are. But we're rather subdued, to be honest with you. And then I see an airplane that was on the drawing board. We didn't know what it was. It's called a C-141. Circle. As we turn a corner, I see this big airplane. It lands. Immediately, some people run out, grab us off the bus, take my arm, take me up the ramp. You know, go up the ramp, and there were about 40 of us at the time. The engines didn't stop. Immediately, shut the door off we go. So, it's about 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, sorry about this. Sorry. <laughs> we're, we're just... Anyway, the captain gets on the horn. When you get over the Gulf Tunnel, and he yells at gentlemen, feet wet. That meant we were over water. We we're out of four feet up. On our way to Philippines. Only then. I'll never forget that. magazines, books. We had people were looking through there. I'm looking through Playboy magazine, for goodness sake. <laughs> <laughs> and hadn't seen a picture of female in five and a half years. <laughs> but when we got over water,
and he was captured, you know, dead in Korea. This is how close life and death is. This sort of sticks with me. He was uh, wounded. He was, a hand grenade was thrown. He put his body between himself and his men and was injured, so he couldn't walk. Put into this Korean, North Korean uh, jail. And every night the farmers would come by and try to torture them. And one day, and so they, <coughs> this whole story goes on and on about how they get water because they weren't fed for 17 days, didn't have any water. So they, they couldn't, nobody could walk because they were injured. So they had this device, again, in, in, in engineering, these guys are engineers, so they always try to come up with answers. They figured out how to get a helmet down into the well so they could get some water. And he went through this whole process of how they got the helmet and water out. But he said, this is how close to death. They, the North Korean, the, I'm sorry, North Koreans were going to kill them. And then one day, a Chinese officer showed up. And this Chinese officer was, could speak English and it was obvious that he had been educated in the United States. And he could see that the, the uh, Chinese officer had some, again, empathy for them. And so this Chinese officer who had no obligation to do this arranged for their release. And that Chinese officer didn't show up. I wouldn't have that, I wouldn't have recorded recording for this guy would have been dead because they would have killed all their, their wounded prisoners. So I get I mean story after story after story. That's why we're doing this. I'm saying this. Uh, I don't know if anybody has recorded the story. I've got a few stories about the, what these guys went through and and uh, how they suffered for America. And I think they should be told. So, but anyway, I'm, I'm, it's just it's better than believe me. It's better than watching a Hollywood movie because uh, Harold Levitt was, was in uh, shot down over uh, Japan in the Second World War. This little thing that sticks with me, he said he, he was going out, it was called the side blister. Anyway, they were bailing out, the, uh, the all the officers were killed, there were two stories to the B-59, uh, B-52, and all the officers at the top story, they were all killed when they were hit by any aircraft, and they, everybody else was bailing out, and he bailed out, and he had a ring on his finger, and, <laughs> and his ring caught up on the strut, so there he is hanging from this airplane, going down in flames. And he pulled out his 45 and he'll shoot his finger off. But at the last minute, he let go. He's the one, he landed in the rice field. This is the guy who was uh, the, uh, the farmers captured him. First of all, he was, trying, he was going to try to get his way out. He was trying to kill a farmer. But the water was too shallow, so he couldn't drown him. And they captured him. They were trying to find somewhere to string him up, to hang him. Because there weren't any trees, it was all rice fields. They were trying to find a building. And this is the army came by. and they, they had a little tete-a-tete -tete with the uh, farmers deciding whose prisoner he was. They, the, eventually the uh, military got him away and they put him in the, they had very few prisoner war camps in Japan. So they lodged him in the emperor's uh, stables. <coughs> after, they, after they killed everybody who were currently in the stables, and they put the new prisoners in the stables. And, and the story about how they survived and uh, everybody was injured and how he tried to nurse this is why we really got my Harold Her story, because it haunts him to this day. One of the, uh, his uh, comrades was severely burned during the mission, and he, he nursed him back to health, feeding him, you know, because he was so good to burn, and finally he got him back to health, and then the uh, guards killed him. And he, and he says to this day, he's guilty of health. You know, did I do the right thing for setting him? And that still haunts him. You know, 50 years later. So these are the stories you're hearing. And so, anyway, that's why it's worth doing. Yes. Any questions? <laughs> All done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.